glad you've chosen to join us this morning for worship today. If you're joining us online, we're glad that you are tuned in with us this morning as well. We're a little bit different this morning. We've had we've run into what everybody else has run into. Uh, we have some in quarantine from COVID. We have some that have had medical procedures. We have some that have dental procedures. But the, the band has uh, taken new shape this morning. We appreciate the guys leading us this morning. Uh, they're going to take over for us, and we appreciate them stepping in. Uh, they're usually part of our band, but not usually just them two alone. Uh, but we, like I said, we've had some people out for various reasons. Everyone is doing well. Everybody is recovering well. Everybody is quarantined well that is, that is out for us this morning. Uh, we certainly want to continue to pray for all those folks. But uh, things are a little different this morning. We are glad you're here, though. We are going to worship no matter what. Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Noah here in a little bit. But we're going to worship first. And we're glad you've joined us, whether you're here live in the worship center or you're live online. We are glad that you have chosen to worship with us. Let's worship together. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, those of you who are able to join us, those of you who are uh, at home watching, we just uh, we hope that you all will um, worship with us as well. Um, if everybody would just please stand. Um, Praise the Lord.
this song is up to you this morning. And let's, let's lead up this morning with your love for the message that will just glorify you.
Yes, yeah, ours. We we sang this quite a few times here at this um, at this church. But I think what I love so much about this song is it takes us through the gospel picture from the start to finish. Um, I think it's really important for us to to end our service, um, our, the, the singing part of our service with um, with having that been brought to the forefront of our minds as we're about to hear this sermon um, that's also going to paint a picture of who God is and what he's done for us. So please sing this with me.
may be seated. Thank you, guys. It's a little weird when you run the camera and you're preaching the same day. So, uh, people at home, I'm sorry if I zoomed in a little early on you there. I had to make my way down. So, as you're having a seat and as you're getting ready there, if you're at home, wherever you're at, you can grab your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 6. We're not going very far this morning. Noah was one that kept popping up 
Uh, there's uh, lots of people, as I said, there's Abraham, there's uh, Isaac, there's you know, just all different things that you can pull out of different people. Daniel, just different things that you can say, hey, this guy had this. David was a guy that was after God's own heart. He said that. Uh, different qualities. But Noah was one I kept coming up with because he, he is just uh, oozing with this idea of faith. He is a man of faith. And as we look at these different characters, uh, it, it's kind of the, the things that I see it is where God wants us to kind of develop some things uh, that we're kind of either in one of two zones. We're either in a comfort zone. So maybe he wants to stretch us and he wants to grow us. He wants to pull out of it. Uh, so we have that one zone in life of the comfort zone. Now, it's a safe zone. Most of us would like, you know, if we're good, we're in the comfort zone. It uh, doesn't require a lot of courage. doesn't require a lot of faith or obedience. You just kind of, just kind of, I'm here. I'm existing. I'm chilling on the couch, whatever it is. Uh, we can hang back. We can settle down if you're in the comfort zone. The problem with the comfort zone, however, is kind of a no growth zone, uh, a zone where you're just kind of stagnant. You're not really moving. It, it, the, the worst thing people think maybe about the comfort zone is that maybe the longer you stay, the more you're going to stay the same. And that's true. The longer you stay in a comfort zone, you're just kind of kind of stay the same for the most part. But however, what we find out, and you see this a lot when people have injuries and sports injuries and stuff, when you sit around and you do nothing, the injury don't get better all of a sudden just because you're resting. It starts, if it's a muscle injury, it kind of goes into atrophy and you start having problems because there's no muscle anymore. Uh, that's why you hear a lot of people when they have Knee, knee surgeries, they have to do a lot of working out and stuff before they have the surgery because they want to keep the muscle built up. And when they get out of the surgery, they have to do that even more uh, because it atrophies. And if you stay in the comfort zone for too long, that's what happens to you. You kind of atrophy. Uh, you start to become something less than what you were. So either we're growing stronger in our development of Christ-like characters or we're growing weaker, kind of one or the other. Uh, so what needs to happen is kind of stretch ourselves out of the comfort zone and get into the other zone, which I kind of call the character zone. Uh, the character zone. It's, it's, a, it's a zone that's it's not always safe, uh, but it's in the character zone that we experience true growth and, and growth that God wants for us. It's there that God can develop the character traits in us uh, to reflect that of what Jesus showed us when he was on earth, and obviously that's someone we can obviously mimic as well. Uh, and it's only in the character zone that we find significance that are enabled to partner with God to build his kingdom and make a difference in our world. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at kind of two qualities. We're going to look at the idea of faith. Uh, we see a Noah, and then we're going to look at an idea of com commitment, integrity, character uh, that we see in Caleb and Joshua. Uh, we'll talk about them next week. Um, we'll, we'll see how God stretches these folks uh, in order to develop these, these characters in them. Uh, and so we're going to pretend we begin today with this portrait of Noah. Uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 6, and I'm going to kind of read a couple verses and talk a little bit, then read a couple verses and talk a little bit. So we're in Gen Gen Genesis 6, and I'm going to read 5 through 8 here as we get started. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil at all, only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his, his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe the, from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So it goes through this thing. I mean, doom and gloom, the Lord's done. He's had enough. Kind of like I felt about Tuesday, about 2 in the morning. As I, For some reason, it was like it's like a train wreck. You're watching the election results, and you're just like, nothing's happening, but I just can't turn away kind of thing. It was kind of one of those. It's like 2 in the morning. They're like, well, Pennsylvania's quit counting. Georgia's quit counting. They'll resume tomorrow. But we're going to keep talking for hours upon hours, and you can listen to us if you want. So it's like. I think I'm just done. And then the next day, you turn on the TV and you look for your regular programming, and it was like election coverage, election coverage, election. It was the same thing for like whatever. It's been 72 hours. It was the exact same program on all the networks and on Fox and on CNN. And I just finally was like, man, I think that's the way God is talking about the earth at this point. He's like, yeah, oh my gosh, it is, it's bad out there. I don't even want to mess with it. He just says, I mean, he goes through three verses there and just says, I'm done. I'm deeply troubled. I'm just going to wipe everybody off the earth. I mean, he was done with everything. I don't think the birds or the animals had done much to him, I don't think. But God was like, I'm just going to wipe everything off the face of the earth. We're just going to start over. I'm taking out the animals. I'm taking out the birds. Taking out the creatures that move along the ground. I regret that I even made them. I mean, that's pretty harsh. I mean, they're sitting around. I don't know if you ever get to the point with your kids where you're like, why did I bring you into this world? Or something, you know, you get to that point. You're like, goodness gracious, what have I done? What have I created here? And I'm sure God is like, holy cow. And then he comes to that last sentence in verse 8, and he says, But Noah, this hauls on a second, he says, But Noah 
uh, and, and kind of goes on about Noah. And the first thing that we learn about Noah is from this passage. It says, and it's this, that Noah had a personal faith. God knew Noah. God knew all about Noah. Uh, some versions of the Bible, uh, this one said it, but it says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of God. In some translations, that word favor is translated as grace. Uh, indeed, grace is something that is basically unmerited favor. You did nothing to deserve it, but you got it anyway. Noah benefited from God's grace. That is only access when you have a personal faith. God knew Noah. God knew what he was all about. Romans 5, 2 says, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace, we now stand. That we have, we, we have access to grace because of what God has done for us. And, and God basically says, Noah's got that grace. Noah's got that favor. Uh, and, and so, you know, God starts to change maybe his idea of what he was going to do. He's, he's all about, I'm wiping out everything. I'm starting over. And then he just mentions Noah. But, but Noah had found favor in the eyes of God. And then it completely changes. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. At this point, it might be helpful to kind of go back and just talk about salvation real quickly. Uh, you have the Old Testament salvation, which is kind of like, uh, basically like a gift certificate kind of thing. Uh, or the New Testament is kind of like a gift certificate. The Old Testament is kind of like a credit card uh, kind of thing. So, see, some people mistakenly think Old Testament believers were saved because of the law or saved because of Moses or saved because of their sacrifices. Uh, but Old Testament believers were saved, were saved the same way New Testament believers were. They had faith in the Messiah. They haven't seen the Messiah. The Messiah hadn't shown up yet. They have been told, foretold about this was coming. Uh, and so they are having faith in the same thing. It just kind of comes about differently a little bit. Uh, Old Testament believers were saved through faith because of the promised Messiah. Uh, New Testament believers are saved through faith because of the promised Messiah who came, which was Jesus, came and fulfilled everything that was talked about. So the New Testament believers are kind of like, they've got this gift certificate. It's already happened. It's done. We're going to cash this gift certificate in. Uh, and... We're good. We, we follow what God, we believe it, we accept it, we follow what God, and that's kind of it. The Old Testament, it's like they had a credit card. They, they believed it's going to happen, and they kind of put their faith in that, and eventually they fill out their, their they realize that it was paid for because of what Christ came and did. So uh, they're kind of pointed to this, or talked about, it talks about that, foreshadows that kind of thing, uh, and Old, Old Testament believers are looking towards the cross. I say all that to, 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 to kind of set the, set this home, because Noah was one who was saved by grace through faith. Uh, just as we are today, but he is he is believing everything that God says. He's having a relationship with God. Uh, his family tree, uh, the, the people that were with him, they kind of were pulled along by his coattails a little bit. It doesn't say much about his family other than uh, occasional mention of them helping him build the ark when he's asked to do this. Uh, it talks a little bit about that, that there were a number of them, and then I don't know that we ever get an exact number of how many people. I learned a lot about Noah as I was reading some of these stories and reading some commentaries this week. Uh, but Noah's family tree, uh, some of their forefathers we, we, we've read about in other parts of Scripture uh, were, were great believers. There was a guy named Methuselah that you've probably heard of. There was a guy named Enoch that we've probably heard of, some forefathers of his. Uh, they were said to have walked with God, so he kind of follows them. There was a guy named Enosh uh, who was a grandson of Adam, uh, and he didn't die until Noah was over 80, so they had some interaction with one another. So that kind of relationship that they had with God was kind of passed down to Noah. Uh, but it, it, it began to benefit Noah because Noah had fulfilled all these kind of things. These people had a relationship, and Noah uh, was considered, it says at one point in Scripture, that he was the only one blameless in the eyes of God. The only one blameless. blameless. So God doesn't have any, uh, you don't inherit your salvation or anything, but uh, it was obviously passed down through uh, generation after generation, and uh, Noah had, was a believer. Noah, Noah uh, had a personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, with, with God, and, and eventually we find out that he had that relationship through the Messiah that was coming. It doesn't come before he's there, but uh, but it's not enough. And what we learned by Noah, it was not enough. And a lot of people were doing this. It wasn't enough just to say, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I know God. Uh, it's not just, just enough to, to know them. Uh, scripture tells us that God knows his children, and his children know him. Uh, and that's through a relationship. I don't know what kind of relationships you all have. I know COVID has changed the way we have relationships with people. Uh, you probably don't have a lot of friends. I mean, I know some of us still hang out with other people, but it's probably not like it was. You don't go out to dinner with 15 friends. One of the restaurants don't allow it. Uh, I think we took a group of like eight or ten yesterday for some of our uh, coaching staff stuff, and they made us spread out uh, even with that. So um, it's, it's a little different in how maybe your relationships are. But when you think of a relationship, you think of conversations. You think of interaction. You think of walking with one another. You think of having a bond. You know things about that person. You know personal things about that person. 
And just to say you know God is not enough. Several years ago, and it's been a while, he's still doing this stuff, but Cameron Mills, uh, some of you may know him, he played basketball for the University of Kentucky. He, uh, when he first left Kentucky and several years after that, he was doing a preaching ministry. He still has a ministry that goes on, but he was going around to a lot of churches doing uh, youth events and uh, retreats and things like that and speaking. I heard him on several occasions, and he often used the same illustration. Uh, no matter what he was talking about, he often brought it back to this. He talked about his relationship with God and how we all should have a relationship with God. We should have a personal relationship with God. It should be something that's growing, something that we're working on, all that kind of stuff. And he often used the illustration that, hey, I played basketball for Ray Virginia. I played basketball for Tubby Smith. He played under both of them. He was in both championship games when those two guys were there. And he was talking about that. And he said, you know, you hear call-in shows, you hear radio broadcasts, you hear interviews on TV, and all these people are like, yeah, Rick Pitino's the man, or Tubby Smith's my favorite. You know, act like they're big buddies. He said, those people know who they are, but I know them. I have a relationship with them. It's different than you seeing them on TV or you seeing them through an interview or you hearing them on the radio. You may think you know them, but you really don't know them, know them until you have a relationship with them. He said, it's the same thing with God. It's not enough just to say, I've got a Bible. It's cool. And this is leather. It's got big print. I've got my glasses off right now. I see it just fine. No problem. Uh, it's a pretty cool little Bible. Uh, over here, if you flip over here, there's red things. Red letters. That's when Jesus is talking. And people can do that. Anybody can pick up a Bible and say, yeah, it's nice cover to cover. It's pretty cool. But do you know what's in it? Have you really got into what it says? Have, do you have a relationship with the person in that it's talking about Scripture? Do you pray? I mean, that's a great connection you have. The fact that you can have a conversation with God, that you can present your request, you can tell the things you struggle with, do you pray? And all those kind of things are part of that relationship. And it's something that we find out in Scripture that Noah had with God. That God knew him. God, God knew him personally. It says Noah found favor. So the easy question on that first part is simply, do you have a personal faith? And so uh, we find out Noah does. And so God uses Noah in an amazing way. Next verse we're going to read is Genesis 6, 9. Just one verse there. Uh, I'm going to read 10, too, because it's kind of it's kind of like they just stick this under the rug. And I'll tell you, well, it's really not. It is important, but it's not important. Uh, verse 9 says, This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. And then there's verse 10. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, Shem, Ham, and Jack. I mean, he just kind of throws in. These are my kids. I just wanted to know about them. Doesn't say anything about them. Uh, we don't, I don't think we get much more. But Shem, Ham, Ham, like ham and cheese. Ham. And Jack, I mean, that's his three sons. He just throws them in there. Every illustration, every commentary, everything I read this week was like, read, talk about verse 3, talk about verse 9, and it skips 10. I mean, we had kids. You know, it's a good thing. It did a good thing. If you, and there's several things you need to get online and look. I was going to use the video, but it's hard to portray video at home. But there's a video of uh, Noah and his sons, not actual footage. I just want to point it out. Of uh, them building the ark. Uh, his, his three sons, every time they'd show up, one of them would be asleep. The other ones would be working, and it was like they were taking shifts. Like, Uh, but that's all Noah saw his sons. So anyway, uh, second verse, uh, second thing I want to point out there from that verse is that Noah had a practiced faith. Noah had a practiced faith, and we know this through several things uh, that, that it talks about just in that one verse that we find out later. He had a practiced faith because there was life transformation. First thing, uh, life transformation. It says he's a righteous man. To be righteous means you are right. God calls us to apply our faith uh, to ourselves and correct what is wrong with us, to, to correct the things that, that need to be correcting in our life, to make them right. That's what he calls us to do. There was a novelist uh, in England, and his name was Charles, I think it's just Reed, uh, but it's R-E-A-D-E. And he made this statement. It's a cool statement when you, when you put it into the context of what they're saying here about, about Noah. And he said, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Now this quote's kind of a neutral quote. It's just do this thing and this will happen. Do this thing and this will happen. However, notice what's happening. We're talking about Noah being righteous. So notice what's happening when we stick something wrong in, the, in that same quote. Sow a wrong thought, reap a wrong action. Sow a wrong action, reap a wrong habit. Sow a wrong habit, reap a wrong character. Sow a wrong character and reap a wrong destiny. Destiny. So conversely, that's the wrong side. When you put right in it, it tells us there to be righteous. You need to make things right. So sow a right thought, reap a right action. Sow a right action, reap a right habit. Sow a right habit, reap a right character. Sow a right character, reap a right destiny. And it, 
it's it, it's a perfect example of what Noah was doing. Noah Noah had done things in his life. I'm sure he has a past, but we don't know about that. We don't get the details of that. But uh, a lot of his past was because we, that we find out was about his family and how he followed in his family and he began to to, to worship God just like his family had. And he had lived blameless before God, uh, and so he had lived a righteous life. It tells us Romans 12:2 tells us to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Uh, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we talked about this comfort zone and this character zone, uh, and so we need to be stretched by challenging and, and changing our thinking to what God's truth is, and that's what Scripture is all about. So we have life change, it talks about, life transformation. Secondly, we have separation from the world. The verse just told us, don't conform to the world. Uh, if you're copying the behavior of the world, you will stand out, <laughs> maybe not positively. Uh, if you're copying them, but if you're not copying them, think how much more you stand out. If you're doing something different, something radically different than what the world's doing, you're going to stand out. Uh, the New Living Translation, as I mentioned earlier, said Noah was the only blameless person living on the earth. Now, I don't know how many people were on the earth at that time. I don't have, we don't have the census from that year. Uh, but this, if, if it was out and said two million people are around, I don't think there was that many, but two million people were out and Noah was the only one, or 100,000 people and Noah was the only one. Or a thousand people, and Noah was the only, only one. He's probably going to stand out. Now, imagine how much more he starts doing that, standing out whenever he started building this ark. Now, you've seen all these portrayals of the ark and uh, everything from Evan Almighty to little documentaries that have been done about it. We have the ark encounter that you can go see up in northern Kentucky. Uh, but all those kind of things, there's always a, a, a group that was just, in any of the, the pictures or the videos that I've seen, there's always the group that was just like, what? I mean, there is. I was watching part of the Evan Almighty thing last night, and they're like, yeah, he's going to uh, build. I mean, it's going like this. Like, it, it, he's building an ark, and he's right outside Washington, D.C. I mean, just what an idiot kind of thing. And I'm sure it was even more, because we'll, we'll talk about this in just a second, but where they had, where God had he build it was basically a desert. <laughs> it wasn't like there was water around there too often. I mean, some things said that it may have never rained there before. Uh, and so separation from the world is kind of key with Noah. He was kind of different from everybody else. Uh, when I was in college, I went to a good old Baptist college, good old Georgetown College, and everybody, I'm sure, is a Christian at those colleges. Everybody. Uh, maybe not. Uh, but uh, one thing that was interesting, you know, you talk about, you know, we did have uh, different things on our campuses. Probably not on every campus. So some of them are. We had FCA and all that kind of stuff. We had a weekly worship service, which I know uh, different organizations have on different campuses. We had devotions in some of our fraternity houses, which that may or may not be happening in other places. I don't know. Uh, but uh, whatever it was, everything you'd go to, they would talk about growing your relationship with Christ. And the thing they would talk about was having quiet times and having prayer times and all that kind of stuff. And, and it's funny. I was there for four years as a student, and I worked there for two or three more after that. And in all the years that I was there, I had one person that I remember ever seeing do a quiet time. And it was so dramatic. I just would check it every once in a while just to see if this guy was really curious. I had him for a roommate for a year. I lived down the hall with me for the other three years I was there. Uh, but every morning, whatever time his class was, he'd get up an hour and a half before that class, and he'd sit in the little living room area, whichever room that he was in at the time, and he would have his quiet time. And the first time it really caught me off guard because I walked in his room because they had a refrigerator and sometimes they had Coke or mail or things that you just couldn't find in the rest of the dorm because everybody drank all those. So I'd sneak in there at like 6 in the morning or 7 in the morning before I go to class and be like, we'll go get one of the red lights this morning. And I walked in there and I looked over and he's just sitting there. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. Uh, and so I start to talk to him. He's like, I'll, I'll get with you in a minute. I mean, he was just focused in on his, his quiet time and did it every day. When I was his roommate, I'd hear his alarm go off and I'd look over at my alarm and I'm like, what class? He don't have class till 9. What the heck? What's wrong with that kid? He'd get up, he'd go sit in there and have his quiet time every day. And just like they're talking about Noah was the only one, he was the only one I ever saw do that. Just every day, set a time, he did it, he carried through with his quiet time. He was the real deal. Uh, he was the real deal, a, a person, he was, I mean, he was a great guy, we still have a great connection today. Uh, but it was different, it was something I didn't see all the time, even though I was on this great Baptist campus and people are all growing in their faith there, sure. And yet he was the only one that I saw all the time. Uh, and he was, he was, living out his faith to the world. And so it, it tells us there that, that we have a we have separation from the world, that we're doing something different because we're Christians. Noah was doing that. Thirdly, dedication to God. Uh, and I think there's two things that I kind of indicated at the beginning, kind of that, that if you're growing a relationship, 
you're walking, uh, kind of get, get closer to someone, you're kind of kind of have a couple of these things. Number one, you're going to meet with them regularly. You're going to be around them. No one met with God regularly. Uh, if you're going to go with anyone somewhere, you're going to meet somewhere before you go there. You can't really go, let's go out to eat tonight, and you never meet up. That doesn't really work together. Uh, but you haven't had a place to meet up somewhere, you're talking somewhere, you're walking. My friend had a quiet time and he met every day with God there. Maybe it's through the Word, maybe it's through prayer, maybe it's something you do regularly. Uh, but he met with God. Uh, and secondly, uh, he went with God. You know, whatever God had called him to do at this point, he had done it. So God was like, he's different. I have favor in this guy uh, because he's different. Uh, Amos 3, 3 says, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? You're not really walking together. You're, I'm going this way and you're going this way. God and him were on the same path. They were going the same direction. Uh, in summer of 1995, I did summer missions. I was on a traveling uh, revival team called Sun Praise. Uh, we went all over the state of Kentucky, did weekend revivals, and during the week we worked out at Cedar Moore and Jonathan Creek camps and, and did camps uh, throughout the week. And uh, toward, I had felt like for a while I was I was ending my college career there. I was graduating from college. I just graduated actually uh, in the summer of uh, 95, and so I had a biology degree, a chemistry minor, they're hanging on my wall, if you don't believe me, I know I don't really use them, I'm not really teaching biology up here, or chemistry, uh, but I had those degrees, and so I was trying to decide whether to go to med school or what, and, but I felt like God had something different for me, and it was during that summer, I can remember the exact moment, the exact instant, the exact, the exact song that was being played, uh, where I was in Campbellsville, Kentucky, actually, at a, at a church, uh, and just... I don't know if I just finally had slowed down enough for God to be able to talk to me or got, I just finally got focused in enough on it, uh, but I felt clearly that God was calling me to do something more. Uh, I didn't know exactly what it was at that time, but I knew it wasn't med school, uh, which was disheartening when you sit around and study biology and chemistry for four years. Uh, it's really not an exciting, exciting track there unless you're going into the medical field or going to the teaching field or something, but, uh, but God completely shifted things because of that. Uh, and, and I think it was just finally I just had slowed down and I focused on God long enough to really hear what his call was on my life. And so Noah had done that. Noah had slowed down. And Noah had seen everything that God was doing. And for God to give the call that he gave him, I mean, just imagine. Hey, go build an ark. I mean, you probably, if some of you have probably seen the modern day version of the Evan Almighty, uh, and it's kind of set like in Washington, D.C., in a political kind of realm. And Evan's a state, a U.S. senator, I think he is. And, um, but just telling him to go build an ark, it would be strange in that instant, it would be strange in Noah's instant to build an ark in the desert, uh, but yet Noah follows him. Uh, Noah, Noah goes on. And, and thirdly, I think that what we find out, we found out he had a personal faith, he had a practice faith, but he also has a powerful faith, uh, a powerful faith. And he wasn't powerful because Noah was this strong, big, Herculean man or anything, uh, but because it was the strength of his faith and who his faith was in. Uh, his faith was in, his object of his faith was in God. Uh, Matthew 17, 19 through 20 says, Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here and there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Uh, that's over in Matthew 17. And, and, and that's the kind of experience, that's the kind of faith that, that Noah had. Uh, the, the kind of faith that was so strong in God that he would rock what he's doing and build an ark in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Genesis 6, uh, verses 11 uh, to 22, uh, kind of gives us the story. Uh, it says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Uh, make rooms in it and coat it with, with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. And he gives him directions. The ark is to be 300 cubic feet long, 50 cubic wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it. Leave below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door inside the ark and make uh, lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away for you, uh, for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. 
And so we get the story of the ark. And it, it, it's an incredible thing, and it's an incredible thing to see. And as I said, uh, it's, it's, it's a powerful faith that you would just simply drop everything and you would follow that. Uh, that you would follow that kind of that kind of crazy adventure that you just, I mean, th there was no one in their right mind that would think, this seems normal. This just seems normal uh, to, to be able to do this. Uh, when I thought about that, uh, I saw a video last week. Most of you know a hurricane hit the lower half of the Central America. Uh, I think it hit Nicaragua first and went across to Honduras. We've been to Honduras several times, and I saw a video of the, there's a waterfall there, uh, and it just made me start thinking of that waterfall. We got to uh, zip line across the waterfall, uh, and uh, it's a crazy thing. It's like a, I don't even know how tall it is, 7,500 foot, I don't know uh, how tall it was, but it's not quite like your zip line experiences here. Uh, a little more be nice about this a little more safety precautions i guess here not that we weren't safe uh but it just here it's like oh, you know they'll test everything they'll pull on those ropes two or three times and they'll do all this stuff they'll give you a little training here we put the things on you got kind of tugged a little bit we got up on the platform but one of our people actually said so are we going to do a few test runs or are we going to do a couple things and he said here clip on this thing and just jump you know she's like what and that's what we did. I mean, we basically said, okay, you're going to zip on these things. And, and uh, here they won't touch you or anything. They'll just push you off over there. You'll go. I mean, it's just, you're going to go one way or another. And so I was just kind of joking around. I'm, I'm a little bit bigger guy than some of the other people that were zip lining. And so I had a little concern. I'm like, is there, it's going to hold me kind of thing. I'm kind of wondering a little bit. And the guy's like, well, we'll just let you go first every time. You're a little bit bigger. So you drop and we know not to go. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so an enjoyable day. And so he did, literally. I was first every time out on a thing. Uh, and we get to that final. Like, you zip up and down this little creek. And it's really not that high until you get to the waterfall. And it's really, you don't realize you're down in the waterfall yet because you've done like six or seven runs across it. And you get there and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute. And you zip out and you just kind of look down and it, there ain't nothing down there. Just that waterfall dropping. I don't even remember how tall it was, but it was a really cool experience, but it was kind of like this whole idea of a leap of faith kind of thing. You literally stepped off and you're like, oh, there's nothing down there. We're going to go. Uh, and uh, the Bible, nowhere in the Bible are we told to take a leap of faith. It's always talked as a walk of faith. That we're just going to walk and do what God said. We're going to take a walk with him. Noah had, Noah had faith in God because he walked with him daily. Uh, Noah had prepared him because he walked with God. We hear about that often. It's not anything that we're just going to jump in and go, no, because we've got God. And that's what this powerful faith was all about, uh, that, that God was with him, that God was strong enough to take care of all his concerns and all, all, everything that was going on. God was going to have his back. In the, the Evan Almighty version, uh, God just kept telling him, I got you. you know, I, I've got you. I've got you. One thing, he's, God is actually like a waiter, and his name is Al, 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 Almighty, A-L, Mighty, kind of thing. Basically saying, I'm in control. I've got you. And God tells him that throughout this throughout this journey. It's not a leap of faith. You're walking with me. You're just continuing to walk with me. Uh, Noah's faith allowed him a couple things. One, it allowed him to see the invisible. He saw God. I mean, he saw God. Uh, when he built the ark, he built it in the middle of a desert. He built the ark on dry land. It hadn't rained. Some, as I said, some scholars said it hadn't rained maybe ever to that point. Uh, he probably thought he was a little Looney Tunes at the time as well. Uh, but he had trained himself to hear God and hear God's voice. And even though he couldn't see him, he heard God, and he knew God was walking with him. Uh, John 16, 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will speak. Whatever he hears, he will also declare to you what is to come. Acts 2 says the Holy Spirit th speaks through dreams and vision. Uh, Rick Warren said, Every vision or dream from God comes in three parts, the what, the how, and the when. God's not going to leave you hanging. God's going to take care of you. Psalm 37 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. So God took care of him. He was able to, to see the, the, the things that no one else could see. To, and then finally, he got to experience the incredible. I mean, what an incredible journey. I read, read something last night, and I looked it up three or four times because I, there, there's differing opinions about how long they were in the ark. I don't think you really thought about that. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. We know that. Uh, that's what Scripture tells us. So if it rains for 40 days and 40 nights and it talks about you couldn't see anything, all you saw was water, Make sure that water's got to recede, and it doesn't like to recede overnight. I don't know how hard it rains at your house. I've got a little place behind my house where water will fill up a little bit. It'll take a day or so for it to go back down if it fills up. Uh, but for 40 days and 40 nights, it fills up quite an amount of water. And I've read something that said it may have taken up to a year before they came out of the ark. And there was one thing that said 150 days. I'm like, well, that's pretty strong. I don't remember reading that anywhere. Uh, they had their scientific backing. But a lot of things say it was a year that they spent in that thing. I don't know. 
I just can't imagine what a wild adventure, something you would never expect, you know, no matter what, and that you're in this thing, and the, the whole time you know that God's got your back. A pretty incredible journey. There's a, there's a book that Dr. Seuss wrote. Um, he wrote some great ones. Uh, but this one was called, Oh, the Places You'll Go. And I pulled some excerpts out of it that I just want to share with you. Uh, and, and just think about this as a, a faith journey that you're on with God. Oh, the places you'll go. Because you'll get to experience incredible things. Maybe not build an ark. I hope you had not been called to build an ark in your backyard. But, but God does some amazing things, the journey that he can place us on. It says, Oh, the places you'll go. This is what it says. It says, Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know, and you are the guy who will decide where you'll go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some you will say, I don't choose to go there. With a head, head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not-so-good street. And you may find... And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener out there. It's wide open air. Out there, things can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along. You'll start happening too. Oh, the places you'll go. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers. You'll soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have speed. You'll pass the whole gang, and two, you'll take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you'll top all the rest. Except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft, and never mix up your right foot from your left. And you will succeed, yes you will indeed, 98 and 3 fourths percent, Guaranteed. Kids, you'll move mountains. So, be your name, Buxbum or Bixby or Bray or Mordecai Allen, Van, Van Allen O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. And as I read that, as I thought about the, the story of Noah and how God took him to some incredible things, I started thinking about the journeys we've been on here at Memorial, uh, mission experiences we've been on to Guatemala, to Honduras, to Canada, to Mexico, to Boston, to Philly. Charleston to Houston to New Orleans to Jefferson City to Cumberland to Frankfurt. And I'm grateful, and, and as I read scripture and I, I read how God moved among all these people, I'm grateful that God's not finished with us yet. I'm grateful that God has an adventure for all of us when we, when we choose to follow him, and that God has some amazing things in store for all of us. And so the final question I want to ask you as we pray, as we wrap up this morning, uh, is, is this question of where do you think your faith can take you? Where will it take you? Where has it taken you? What has God got left for you? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your word and for prayer, for connecting with us, Lord. I thank you for a guy like Noah who you saw as blameless among everyone. I pray that you would help us to, to live a life of faith, that you would help us to, to live a life of commitment, that we would be faithful in following you no matter what the call, Lord, that even when things seem a little strange and that you're calling us out way out sometimes of our comfort zone, you're asking to step off a ledge and zip line over a waterfall in a foreign country. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would guide us and that you would show us that you go before us so we can have a powerful faith because our faith is in the most powerful being of all time, Lord, that's you. And I thank you for that. I thank you for sending your son Jesus that we can have a personal faith with him, uh, that we can have a practice faith because we are worshiping you. We are in your word daily. We are praying to you. We are seeking you in, in good times and bad when times seem so uncertain like they do now. When we don't know who the leader of the country is half the time, when we don't know what the results of the election are because they're telling us there's a fight. I mean, whatever it is, Lord, we know that you're in control. When, when we don't see what's going to happen when the end of this pandemic is going to occur, we know that we can trust you because you're in control. When we get quarantined for 14 days or bed, bedridden because of a, a surgery or a procedure, that we know that we can trust you because you're in control. So I pray for all of our folks here at Memorial, pray for those that are here, those that are tuning in, whether they're one of our members or just someone that was passing by, I pray that you would show us that we're all on the journey together and that we can all look to you because you're ultimately uh, in control and you're ultimately the God of all of us. And we thank you for that. I ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us. Whether you're tuning in or you're here next week, we'll talk about Caleb and Joshua. They're two of my favorite people of all time. Uh, if I, if I said if I ever had twins, I would name them Caleb and Joshua. We're a little past that, so if anybody you can use that, if you have twins one day, you can name them Caleb and Joshua. But great story about some great guys who followed God uh, and were committed to whatever he had, uh, had them going for. 
Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Have a great week.